thank you so much for waiting. So there are quite um, a few of you here already, but we're going to, as always, just give some time for some people to come in, sometimes Zoom kind of staggers people into the room. Um, as you can imagine, I'm extremely uh, excited about this conversation as like, like with last week um, and, and the weeks before, we're, we're having great contemporary Pan-Africanists talking about um, um, contemporary and past um, Pan-Africanist. But this is quite special because of course, Dr. Appiah is still here and still producing work. So um, it will be great to see how um, Dr. Appiah speaks about some of that work as well. Okay, so. So some of you may be used to seeing Ekaite here. Um, Nigel just reminded me. Um, this is I, I do other things for the Center of Pan African Thought. This is my first time hosting the Pan African Pantheons lecture series. So I'll introduce myself um, more more formally in, in a little bit. My name is Apeke Umolu, and um, this is the first of three of the Pantheon series that I'm going to be um, chairing. So you will see Akaita again. She will be back with you. Um, I hope that I can do her justice and hold the conversation together. So um, I think we've got quite a few people in. So um, I think it's going to be pretty similar to um, how Ekaite, you know, kind of led the proceedings. I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes at the beginning that will um, hopefully settle the crowd and also allow more people to come in and to give, I think, a, a thorough introduction to our, our eminent speaker here today. Now, I would like this session to be as interactive as possible. I think the more interactive the session is, the more comments we get, then it will definitely help Dr. Ampia to know that A, we can hear him because you know it's Zoom, um, things can um, go in and out. It would also allow him to know we appreciate him and we are following with what he is saying. So I think if you can um, just kind of get into the uh, mood because I will be asking for your comments as we go on. And I'm going to start by asking you all to please let me know where you are calling us from, dialing us from today. I am from the outskirts of London. I'm in Kent. It is extremely hot, so I'm extremely happy because we never get this sort of weather. So where are you all um, joining us from today? Please let us know. And let's see. Okay, so Canada. Um, ah, Professor Knight, uh, wonderful to see see you here today. Um, you you all will remember um, Professor Knight led us in a wonderful conversation about Dudley Thompson a few weeks ago. Um, Nigel, who is the director of the center, he's calling us from Hitchin in the UK. We've got Boston, so North America, well represented. I'll add myself, Kent, UK, yeah, South Africa. Wonderful. Hi, Zuzile, calling us from South Africa. Brazil, but living in Glasgow. Oh, wow. Um, Elaine, I'm sorry if you've, you've, you're missing out on that wonderful, wonderful weather. Um, hello, um, Professor Daniels. Um, again, you'll remember Professor Daniels, if you guys were here last time, gave us a wonderful, one, wonderful insight into Malcolm X. So please keep going. While you're going, I'm going to, to start. Um, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of the Pan-African Pantheon Lecture Series, hosted by the Centre of Pan-African Thought. Headed by Nigel Stewart, the Centre is proud to have worked with Professor Adekeyi Adebayo, Adebajo to bring to the world these seminal series of lectures in which leading Pan-Africanists of today introduce us to the life, work and thought of the great men and women um, and who, who have and continue to hold place in a pantheon of Pan-African leaders. I'm going to be speaking, as I said, for a little while before I pass over to our main draw, Dr. Kweku Ampia, with whom I will be discussing his wonderful contribution to this collection, which is the Pan-African Pantheon Collection, um, detailing his thoughts about the philosopher Kwame Anthony Appia on what makes a Pan-Africanist. I introduced myself a little bit before, but I'll give you a full introduction now. My name is Apeke Molu, and I am the director of the African History Project, a specialist school of black history, political thought and culture. It's a deep honor for us to be here um, with Nigel and the team to chair these series of conversations. I've already had the honor of meeting with Professor Ampia earlier this evening, 
And even then, I could not resist drawing him into conversation about his work and his ideas that we will be discussing here today. Thus, I'm confident that in Professor Ampia, we have an eminent scholar who to take us through the work of an equally eminent scholar, because I think eminence surely is a prerequisite for anyone seeking to handle Kwame Anthony Appiah's musings on Pan-Africanism. If you have not already noticed, we are talking with and about two great Ghanaians here today. The Saturdays versus the Wednesdays, the Kwame's versus the Kwekus. Well, Professor Ampia, I know you do not agree with everything that your co-national has to say, but today is literally your day. We are on a Wednesday. So I hope your line of argument will prevail in today's conversation. An Akan man, he may be, but it is to Japan that we turn for Professor Ampia's expertise. A professor of Japanese politics, post-war diplomacy and modern history, Professor Ampia is based at the University of Leeds, though he had told, he has told me, I hope you won't mind me saying, that he's on his way to Tokyo to undertake research. A committed Pan-Africanist, Professor Ampia brings a unique perspective to discourses on Pan-Africanism, as it is rare to find a Pan-African scholar steeped in Eastern as opposed to Western political and economic culture. I hope in our conversations, ask Professor Ampia whether he feels this unique perspective allows him to approach discourses on the relationship between Africa and the West differently. Never want to stray too far from home, Dr. Ampia has written on the similarities between Akan values and Confucianism, and he is currently working on um, research looking at Japanese development um, investment into Ghana in the 1960s, which is, of course, the period of time that saw some of the most fervent Pan-African discourse on the continent. Thus, with such a wonderful um, CV, you should already have your questions going. Um, but I'm going to start things off by um, letting us help Dr. Ampia to get a gauge of what we already think in the group about what he's going to say. So he can either dispel some of the things or place Dr. Um, Appia's views in context based on where we're all starting from. So my first question is that we are here to discuss Pan-Africanism. But for you, what is the single most important characteristic of a Pan-African? We are going to be dissecting the thought of um, somebody who believes that there's a very specific part of Pan-Africanism we all need to let go of, but it would be wonderful to know for everybody in the room, if you had to pick one characteristic that was the single most important characteristic of a Pan-Africanist, what would it be and why? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go in as well. Nigel, I know you're probably already primed knowledge of self oh what a wonderful way to start thank you marcus knowledge of self there's so much in there so much in there i guess esteem as well would um would also be there. that's probably going to be mine um i'm a i'm a, I'm a blydenite i don't know if you call if you if, if that's what we're called uh, uh followers of blyden so definitely the african personality that i would say esteem is very high high on the list i can see i can see people with the hands on chins hard so much, so many options. Okay, so we've got two things that are quite, I think, at the psychological level in consciousness. We are talking about a philosopher here today. So that makes sense. Anybody else think there are any material things that make a Pan-Africanist? Um, Freddie, self-determination and empowerment. Okay, great. So this is now getting towards more political theory. The idea that how we organize ourselves um, on a political point of view. Um, Nigel, anti-capitalist. Oh, I love this. Thanks, Nigel, for giving us the definition in the negative, anti-capitalist. <laughs> okay, so is that basically socialist? Is that what you mean? Maybe, maybe, okay. <laughs> maybe I'll wait for one, one or two more. Um, let's see, anybody else have any ideas? Trying to, I'm trying to get to one. I wonder if anyone's gonna name the one that we're gonna be really talking about today. Let's have a look. So we'll take um, Professor Daniels. Love. Oh, wow. For the faces in the mirror. Wonderful. I guess that again speaks to esteem and pride. And perhaps, uh, yeah, it is deep. Absolutely, Nigel. Please do keep those coming in. I think that it will be great for Dr. Ampia to have those going while he now leads us in what I know is going to be a wonderful, wonderful exploration of his chapter and his wider thoughts on the work of Professor Kwame Appiah. So over to you, Dr. Ampia. 
Right. Thank you very much for a very kind uh, introduction. I, of course, I am delighted to be asked to participate in, in, in the series. And I'm also grateful that I was able to contribute to the publication of the Pan-African Pantheon. I am speaking this evening with reference to my essay with the title Kwame Apia, The Cosmopolitan Pan-Africans. And I would like to cut straight to the chase, if I may, to affirm, as indicated in the title of my essay, that Kwame Apia is indeed a Pan-Africanist. I say that because that some of you would know, uh, there are many who would immediately say that Apia is not a Pan-Africanist and even go to the extent of suggesting that uh, Apia is opposed to the very idea of Pan-Africanism. It is true uh, I, have to, I have to admit that Apia does not believe Africa is culturally united. And as such, he likes to emphasize the cultural diversity of Africa and Africans. And this is, I suppose, not least because he thrives intellectually on the cosmopolitan content of uh, the human existence you would find in several of his writings that he interrogates the uh, interrogates and challenges the very concept of identity. So that in his uh, 2018 book, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity, he shows as others before him have done, of course, how identities are constantly fabricated, imagined, of course, uh, reinvented to achieve uh, certain political ends. In his classic work of 1992, In My Father's House, Africa in the Philosophy of Culture, which I will reference extensively in this discussion, he quotes the Ghanaian philosopher Kwesi Buredu uh, to make the point, to make the point that, and I quote him here, what is distinctive in African traditional thought is that it is traditional and that there is nothing especially African about it. I suppose he's right. At the same time, he reminds us that, and this is what he wrote in 1992, uh, that we Africans share a continent and its ecological problems. We share a relation of dependency to the world economy. And we share a problem of racism in the way the industrial world thinks of us. Uh, and and it's, it's interesting that he uses the word, uh, the phrase industrial world. Apia makes an interesting point when he says, and I quote him again here, because the value of identities is relative, we must argue for and against them case by case, unquote. He then goes on to say that given the current situation in Africa, I think it remains clear that another Pan-Africanism, the project of a continental uh, the project of the continental fraternity and sorority, not with emphasis on not, of course, not the project of a racialized Negro nationalism can be a progressive force. In other words, he thinks the Pan-Africanism that exists now is not good enough. He further makes the point that and I quote him again, if there is a Pan-Africanism of an African diaspora, it should be released from bondage 
to racial ideologies, unquote. The point, uh, I suppose the bas basic point he's making is that, and this is a provocative one, I think, it is crucial that we recognize the independence of the Pan-Africanism of the diaspora and the Pan-Africanism of the continent. So he's trying to isolate these entities uh, and, and compartmentalize them, which is an interesting, but most certainly a provocative idea. There are, of course, in these passages that I've just outlined, more than glimpses of our peers' criticism of what he calls the old Pan-Africanism, which he goes to great lengths to critique and evaluate. What seems to irritate Apia the most, I think, is the concept of race and the racial ideologies that emanate from it. He says that race is an oxymoron, it doesn't exist. And I suppose he's right. Anyhow, for our purposes, I would like to take him on a little bit here, uh, discuss and challenge some of his views uh, about Pan-Africanism. But before I get onto that, I would like to spell out the outline of my talk, if I may. Firstly, I, I would like to make some brief comments, some brief bi bi biographical comments about Apia himself, and then I will go on to discuss his views about Pan-Africanism, of course, with a view to uh, interrogating his work. I will then discuss how he treats three leading Pan-Africans uh, and, and conclude with some uh, remarks at the end. Apia, as has been already mentioned, is a philosopher and he's a cultural theorist, an academic and an intellectual who has written extensively about African intellectual history. His work, his classic work that is, In My Father's House, Africa in the Philosophy of Culture, which was published in 1992 by Oxford University Press, testifies to how he positions African philosophies in the mainstream philosophical discourses, foregrounding African philosophical thoughts and scholars of African philosophies in a manner that I believe has helped to make philosophy, uh, the, st the study of philosophy that is a bit less Eurocentric. More broadly, as some of you would know, Apia writes about nationality and class, culture and religion, uh, gender and se sexuality, and uh, uses these as sources to discuss identity. He is currently a professor at New York University's Department of Philosophy and was previously professor of philosophy at Princeton. He did his undergraduate and postgraduate studies at the University of Cambridge, having attended school in England. I would say Apia grew up in England. He was born to Joe Apia, a former barrister and Ghanaian politician, and Peggy Apia. Joe Apia, his father, was a member of the Ashanti royalty, apparently a direct descendant of Osei Tutu, the Ashanti warrior king of pre-colonial Ghana. And he was also distantly related to the great Ashanti warrior, Akroman Pim, who historians tell us was instrumental in the territorial expansion and the establishment of the Ashanti kingdom. 
on his mother's side, Apia, uh, comes from a long line of prominent, sorry, prominent British politicians and parliamentarians. And not surprisingly, he tends to dwell extensively on his pedigree in his writings of our culture and identity. So talking about identity, Apia is referred to as a Ghanaian and British, but as he himself points out, and I quote him here, unlike my three sisters, I have never been a Ghanaian citizen. I was born in England before Ghana's independence and my parents never applied for a Ghanaian passport for me. By the time it was up to me to apply, I was used to being a Ghanaian with a British passport. And he says categorically that he's Ghanaian and so he is. Ideologically, I would say that Apia is a flamboyant liberal. And for that reason, he believes, he believes in Western capitalism as the best means to build a country's economy and society. Let me, let me turn uh, my attention to the topic of our interest Pan-Africanism. Apia is eloquent in his discussion and assessment of Pan-Africanism, but in his monograph, in my father's house, he does not really provide us with a manageable working definition of, of Pan-Africanism. However, in the publication, Africana, the Encyclopedia of the African and African-American Experience, which he co-edited with Henry Louis Gates Jr. Apia wrote that, and I quote him, Pan-Africanism is a wide range of ideologies that are committed to common political and cultural uh, projects for African and people of African descent, unquote. He then says that Pan-Africanism uh, in its most straightforward version uh, is a political project calling for the unification of our, all Africans into a single African state to which those in the African diaspora can return. In its vaguer, more cultural forms, Pan-Africanism has pursued literary and artistic projects that bring together people in Africa and its diaspora. Indeed, he affirms that, and I quote him again, Africans in their common search for political independence from the metropolitan states of Europe articulated a common vision of post-colonial Africa through a discourse inherited from pre uh, from pre-war Pan-Africanism. And that discourse was the product largely of black citizens of the new world. He argues that the solidarity that developed between the black citizens of the Americas and Africans around the ethos of Pan-Africanism was hewn out of various folk theories of race. It's interesting he didn't say folk stories, he says folk theories of race. But, but he concedes uh, that was inevitable because of the racism Blacks suffered both in the New World and in Africa. Furthermore, he says the reality of Nazi racism necessitated an organizing principle of political solidarity that justified and accepted the categories of race to counter racism. 
and he contends that the lessons the Africans drew from the Nazis was not the danger of racism itself, but the falsehood of the opposition between a humane European modernity and the barbarism of the non-white world. In, in other words, the, the barbarism of the European civilization was obvious to all in how the murderous tools of modernity were applied against fellow Europeans. Yet, interestingly, Apia tries to construct a distinction between what race meant to educated Blacks in the New World, on the one hand, and what it meant to Africans. He says on page six of his 1992 monograph that, and I quote it again, what race meant to the new Africans affected was not on the whole what it meant to the educated Blacks in the Americas. For many African-Americans raised in the segregated American society and exposed to the crudest forms of discrimination, social intercourse with white people, he says, was painful and uneasy. And then he says that many of the Africans, on the other hand, my father among them, took back to their homes, European wives and warm memories of European friends. A very odd idea, I think, totally relevant a point, I, I would say, because you see, he, this makes me want to say that there were perhaps more interracial marriages in probably New York, New York alone that is, than there were in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa in the 1950s. But th that didn't make any, or doesn't seem to make any impression on up here. Indeed, many Africans and also many African-Americans might have had warm memories of white friends and acquaintances, but that should or would not have made them oblivious to this, uh, systemic racism in Africa, in Europe, in America, the forms of racism that undermine the well-being of black people all over the world. See, the, the point is that Nkrumah, for example, had European friends, but that did not stop him from pursuing the end of British colonial rule in the Gold Coast. On the other end of the spectrum, James Baldwin, for example, might have had warm memories of white friends in New York and Paris, but he was also painfully aware of the wicked nature of racism in New York, which indeed might have been conceivably less obnoxious and dangerous compared with uh, racism in the South. Now, here's another point in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, we are confronted with a situation where Kurtz was ruthless to the tribal community he dominated, but apparently the community still worshiped him. So I'll leave that hanging and perhaps we can talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Anyhow, I, I counter the contrast Apia draws between the racism in America and uh, white racism in Africa and, and the political implications he tries to project out of it. For one thing, what the Nazis did to the Jews and indeed the whole blunder of World War II, I believe, reinforced to blacks all over the world the comprehensive nature of the danger of racism as to make them wonder what could happen to them if the Europeans could be that brutal to people of their own race. And there is the issue of the atomic bomb, that bomb that, uh, the bombs that were dropped on the Japanese would have further confirmed 
for blacks everywhere. The factor of race in how European civilizations viewed the world. I suppose the point that I wish to make here is that while Apia attempts to draw a distinction between Africans and blacks in the diaspora about the issue of race and racism, in fact, the events of the Second World War would have unified them on the issue of race and racism. Okay, so in the next part of the discussion, I would like to look at how Apia treats three Pan-Africanists. Then these are Alexander Cromwell, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Kwame Nkrumah. Cromwell is widely regarded as one of the fathers of African nationalism, of course. And this is because he, his writings inaugurated the discourse of Pan-Africanism. And according to Apia, at the core of Krumo's vision is a single guiding concept, and this is race. Apia argues that Krumo believed that there was a common destiny for the people of Africa, meaning black people, because they belong to this one race. He argues that Cromwell's belief was not based on an understanding that black people shared a common ecology, nor because they had a common historical experience or faced a common threat from Imperial Europe. Therefore, he concludes that Cromwell was a racist. But interestingly, he wasn't quite sure whether Cromwell was an extrinsic racist or an intrinsic racist. These are his terms, interesting concepts. Extrinsic racists make moral distinctions between members of different races because they believe that the racial essence entails certain morally relevant qualities, he says. And they discriminate between people because they believe that members of different races differ in respects that warrant the differential treatment. Intrinsic races are people who differentiate morally between members of different races because they believe that each race, each race has a different moral status quite independent of the moral character, uh, characteristics entailed by its racial essence. And an intrinsic racist, he says, holds that the bare fact of being of the same race is a reason for preferring one person to another. He argues that the racism that on the lay Cromwell's Pan-Africanism uh, Pan would, and I quote him here, if articulated, have been fundamentally intrinsic. In other words, he thinks Cromwell was an intrinsic racist. And he makes the logical jump, as it were, from that to say that Pan-Africanism inherited Cromwell's intrinsic racism, but he qualifies this by saying that, well, we can't actually say it inherited it from Cromwell, since in his day, it was a common intellectual property of the West. At the same time, Apia argues that we can see Cromwell as emblematic of the influence of this racism in black intellectuals. Black intellectuals brings me to Du Bois.
it is obvious that if Cromwell and his contemporaries found that the intellectual articulation of Pan-Africanist thought, it was W.E.B. Du Bois who established both, both the intellectual and practical foundations describing Negroes, as Apia put it, a, uh, a socio-historical community and prescribing what the community can achieve through common action. And Apia refers to du, du Bois' theoret uh, theoretical ra uh, racism as extrinsic, but he describes Du Bois' feelings as those of an intrinsic racist because he quote, uh, I quote him here, he wanted desperately to find in Africa and with Africans a home, a place where he could feel that he belonged, unquote. Apia says that intrinsic racism is a moral error and extrinsic racism entails what he calls false beliefs. So you could say that he thought that Du Bois wanting to find a home in Africa where he belonged was based on false beliefs, you say. Let me now reflect a little bit on Apia's thoughts about Nkrumah's Pan-Africanism. -Afri which are also quite intriguing, I would say. According to Apia, Cromwell's influence profoundly impacted the rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric of post-war uh, African nationalism. And he says it is striking how much of Cromwell we can hear in a speech that Nkrumah made in Liberia in 1952. So I'll read you the passage that he quotes from Nkrumah's book. And this is uh, Nkrumah's 1957 autobiography of Kwame Nkrumah. The passage that Apia presents says, it was providence that had preserved the Negroes during their years of trial and exile in the United States of America and the West Indies, that it was the same providence which took care of Moses and the Israelites in Egypt centuries before. A greater exodus is coming in Africa today and that exodus will be established when there is a united, free and independent West Africa. Africa for the Africans, a free and independent state in Africa. We want to be able to govern ourselves in this country of ours without outside interference. So that's the quote that uh, Apia lifted from Nkrumah's 1957 autobiography of Kwame Nkrumah. And the implication here is that Nkrumah was a racist because he was emphasizing race in this message. But I suppose we all know that how and what we select or deselect from the information that is available to us is inherently political. Because while I appear quotes from the autobiography of Nkrumah, for some reason, he does not comment on further parts of the speech in which Nkrumah proclaimed that, and I quote that from the book, from that same book, we believe in the equality of races. We believe in the freedom of the peoples of all races. 
We believe in cooperation. In fact, it has been one of my theses that in this struggle of ours, in this struggle to redeem Africa, we are fighting not against race and color and creed. We are fighting against a system, a system which degrades and exploits. And wherever we find the system, the system must be abolished. That was part of the speech that Nkrumah made in Liberia in January 1952. Now the system that Nkrumah has had in mind was colonialism and imperialism. He wasn't particularly talking about race. He wasn't talking about white people. He was talking about an elaborate system that had the objective to exploit, denigrate, and dehumanize. In fact, in Nkrumah's book, that's the autobiography, he reminisces about Kwejri Agri, the Gold Coast missionary and teacher, and notes how Agri was quite critical of some of the things that Marcus Garvey said in relation to Africa for Africans. In, in essence, in its evolution, I argue, uh, contrary to what Apia says, in its evolution, Pan-Africanist thought has been what I call a broad church, not a homogeneous one. Uh, and this is evident in what Du Bois, for example, says about Garvey's tone and style of Pan-Africanism. And indeed, Cromwell and Doug, uh, Frederick Douglass held contrasting views on the issue of race and black progress. If Cromwell, uh, if, if Cromwell's plans for black progress always included the ingredients of ethnic pride and collective effort, those were apparently Douglas's pet peeves. And we also know that the views of individual Pan-Africanists naturally evolved. So Malcolm X, for example, recalibrated his perspective to accept the idea that the struggle for liberation of black people could not be racially defined to exclude true revolutionaries. And this was partly based on uh, a conversation that he had in Accra in May, 1964 with Taha Guide, the Algerian ambassador to Ghana. So up here is in my in my estimation, wrong when he says that Pan-Africanism inherited Cromwell's intrinsic racism. And I believe he knows that because he further qualifies the statement by submitting that, and I quote him here, we cannot actually say Pan-Africanism inherited it from Cromwell, since in his day, it was a common intellectual property of the West, unquote. Appear is also wrong, you see, to suggest that the movement inherited the racism of the West. Now, even accepting that Cromwell was a racist, based on Appear's definition, of course, that in itself does not make Pan Africanism a racist movement, even if we agree that it was indeed a nationalist. In it, uh, it was indeed nationalist in its orientation. Du Bois also informs us that at the London meeting of the Third Pan African Congress in 1923, Harold Lasky, H.G. Wells, Lord Olivier spoke at the event. And Ramsey MacDonald also 
spoke at the, uh, was expected to speak at the event. Indeed, all these Englishmen had been invited by the organizers of the Congress to speak. Apparently, the Congress also held meetings with leading Labour Party members during which uh, they planned to organize meetings between uh, white and black labor in England and America and elsewhere. Du Bois further planned to talk to, uh, to uh, white leaders of the world to cooperate with them for a chance to create better life chances, as he put it, for black people. And all of this suggests that Pan the Pan-Africanist movement, at least in the 1920s, was determined to collaborate with its rele relevant co compatriots, irrespective of skin color. More importantly, uh, the correlation that Apia attempts to build between Cromwell and the rhetoric of post-war African nationalism, in my estimation, uh, estimation, is asserted rather than proved. So using Nkrumah as an example, parts of the speech he made in Liberia in 1952 might indeed evoke sentiments that Cromwell may well have expressed, of course. On the other hand, like Cromwell, Nkrumah quite clearly was simply taking his cue from biblical uh, passages about the Exodus. Basically, the sources of Nkrumah's inspiration in this particular instance might have been the Bible, you see. Uh, I suggest that Nkrumah did not, in fact, need guidance from either Cromwell or, or, or Blyden. Therefore, appears point that, and I'm quoting him again here, it is striking how uh, much of Blyden, uh, sorry, of Cromwell we can hear in Nkrumah's speech in Liberia in 1952 is completely unfounded. As a matter of fact, Nkrumah doesn't even mention uh, Cromwell in his autobiography. So I'm not quite sure where uh, Apia got his idea in, in, in this particular respect from. Okay, so I'm going to uh, make some concluding remarks very quickly. I, I agree with, uh, with the implications of Apia's arguments that Pan-Africanism has been parochial in its ambitions and in how it has attempted to implement those ambitions. The point is racism is not the only obstacle to dignity, you see. And Apia notes as an example that, and I quote him here, a life of handouts is not dignified. The dignity of people with severe uh, physical disability is often challenged, he says. Denying women equal rights with men undermines their dignity. And forcing gay people and lesbians to deny their sexuality is undignifying to them, he says. So by evoking the issue of human dignity in this fashion, appear automatically uh, challenges the Pan-Africanist tradition, impressing on the Pan-Africanist movement, the need to widen its remit, to widen its remit and ambitions beyond what he sees as a primary focus on race and race related issues. After all, he, he doesn't believe that race exists, scientifically speaking. 
race is an oxymoron. How, as Apia might ask, is the free will of gays and lesbians articulated in the Pan-Africanist discourse? Indeed, how are the identities of such a group protected and encouraged to flourish in contemporary African countries? And how is their right guaranteed and ensured? On the other hand, and this is where I depart from up here, his point that Pan-Africanism inherited Cromwell's intrinsic racism is hopelessly un unconvincing. If the movement is guilty of racism, I say, the source of that guilt is most certainly not Cromwell, but the progenitors and propagators of race theories in Europe and North America. I think in one sense, this is probably where I would want to stop, but to point out that Apia says race is an oxymoron. The deeper truth, however, is that racial essentialism as a byproduct of race theory but an illusion nevertheless is part of the fabric of political discourses in the West. Uh, at the very least, we know that it is a, a weapon that people, organizations and institutions wield to assert a hierarchy in the economic and political values of, uh, and systems uh, of our societies. I'll stop here. Thank you.